Hello, I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge, we offer these short Bible studies on our lectionary readings. This week, we are in the second week of Advent. Time is certainly going by pretty quickly, isn't it? And we're in a very familiar passage of Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. This is the chapter, or the beginning of the chapter, is about John the Baptist, the one who came to prepare the way for the Lord. Our commentary today is by Stanley Saunders of 2022. So let's take a look at the bigger picture that um, this introduction in, in Matthew chapter 3 holds for us. This episode interrupts the larger story of Jesus to introduce the one who prepares the way of the Lord. While informing us about John, the baptizer's role, it also locates the ministries of John and Jesus in the larger biblical drama of the redemption of God's people. The narrative arc of the Bible runs from God's creation of heaven and earth, followed by human rebellion and the surrendering of earth from heaven. Through God's various attempts to restore Israel in order to fulfill their mission to the inauguration of God's work to restore and renew the broken creation in the ministry of Jesus. Knowing who we are and what kinds of practice define us has everything to do with knowing where we are in the larger story set forth in the Bible. So let's take a look and be reminded of what John the baptizer says in Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 through 12. In those days John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make paths, make his paths straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then the people of Jerusalem and all of Judea were going out to him, and all the region along the Jordan, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff, he will burn with unquenchable fire. As we look to what John the Baptist is doing, he is building the road. Matthew's biblical quotations are meant to be flashy and bright signs. Pay attention, this is important. Matthew 3.3 3 links John with Isaiah 43, as well as the Exodus 23 verse 20 and Malachi chapter 3. Isaiah envisions the preparation of a straight road upon which God returns to God's people, running from captivity in Babylon back across the desert to Judah. Exodus 23:20 20 promises a messenger who will go before the people to guard them on the way to the land God has promised them. Malachi 3 identifies a messenger who prepares the way for the Lord, who will come suddenly to his temple. Matthew 3, chapter um, verse 3 confirms that God is once more coming to redeem God's people. Matthew dresses John firmly in the likeness of Elijah, who, like John, fearlessly called the people, especially their rulers, to repentance. John's diet and location in the wilderness demonstrate his complete reliance on what God provides, recalling Israel's sojourn to the wilderness. Both diet and location also constitute an implicit critique of Jerusalem, its temple, and its leaders. John calls them away from the holy city and the temple toward the wilderness, a place of danger and testing, but also the place in which Israel was formed, where God's provision and care was demonstrated, and the people grew ready for God's promises. 
John's audience includes not only Jerusalem and all of Judea coming for baptism, but also many Pharisees and Sadducees. It's not clear in the text whether the latter come to be baptized or to critically observe what John is doing. Have they heard or sensed something of the wrath to come? John suggests that the elites think their claim to be Abraham's offspring will suffice. In any case, those who trust their human marks of success and status will resist repentance, which requires a turn from the human things we trust. They have not yet borne the fruit of repentance. So John tells them the ax is already at the root of the tree, a classic image of judgment against human pride. Because it has borne no fruit, their tree will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Then John contrasts his own power and baptism with that of the still more powerful one for whom he is preparing the way, who baptizes not with water, but with the Holy Spirit and fire, images that suggest both redemption, perhaps the return of God's spirit to the temple, and judgment. The way ahead brings not only comfort to Jerusalem, but to its leaders, the refiner's fire. John's way of preparing a straight path focuses on repentance, that is, turning from the ways of this world to practices that fit the time of God's coming. Jesus identifies these practices in passages such as the Sermon on the Mount. His reply to John's question about whether he is really the one to come, the sign acts that define his own ministry, the parable of the sheep and the goats, and more generally in his practices of inclusion and welcoming, which nurture forgiveness, reconciliation, restoration, and wholeness. So who resists repentance? Why would we resist repentance? Repentance is harder for those who, for those more deeply invested in or comfortable with the current order of things. As were the Sadducees and the Pharisees who come to observe John's baptism, and as many of us are today, it may be easier and necessary for comfortable people to change when confronted with a great social or personal crisis, which requires us to challenge our prevailing narratives, as when today we must face the realities of racism or climate change, survival lies in critically examining, repenting of, and replacing the narratives that have brought us to crisis. Wisdom entails repenting prior to crisis. Be aware, repentance aims to change us. For Christians, repentance is not a religious moment or experience in which we come to God, but then continue to live within the social narratives and structures that constitute life as usual. Repentance is a perpetual state of readiness to challenge our commonplaces, the myths we live by, which produce not the fruit of repentance, but the practice of alienation and violence we too easily take for granted. So as we look to John the Baptist, why did John the Baptist preach such stern warnings? Well, we can say one, he wanted to grab people's attention. And when we hear stern warnings, oftentimes we hear, pay attention, pay attention, be aware. I think the next question is um, probably even more important. Do these warnings apply to us today? Why or why not? Well, granted, we are living in a very different time than John the Baptist, but I think God is always calling us um, to repentance, that repentance is just a source and part of our life. We talk about living into our baptismal promises. Each and every day as we live into our baptismal promises, we repent. We um, allow the waters of our shower or of our face or whatever we might be washing to be cleansed and clean that day so that we might start each day afresh and anew. Repentance is hard work because it requires us to look at ourselves. And in some ways, um, we don't like to use this language very often, but it's a, a death to self and to really looking towards God and, and trying to live um, in God's ways and in and how God sees things. And so repentance um, oftentimes requires that cleaning of the soul, which is so difficult to come to terms with. 
I hope that in this Advent season, the season of waiting, the season of preparation, and uh, that the season of watching and looking, that you might find opportunities to see God at work, that maybe you see an opportunity for reconciliation and family. Maybe you see an opportunity um, for a repentance of knowing that, okay, I've been living this certain way and now it's time to change. And perhaps repentance for you at this time is not that drastic. But still, God calls us to stop, to pause, to think, to reflect. And to prepare our hearts for the way of the Lord. God's blessing to you this week and in our Advent um, journey. Grace and peace.